So peripheral artery disease is blockage or obstruction to, to arteries other than those in the heart and the brain. Um, of course, obstruction to blood vessel in the brain, we call that a, a stroke or a CVA. Obstruction to the blood vessel uh, in the heart, we, we, we regard that as, uh, you know, patients having chest pain, angina, or heart attack. Um, but, but it's interesting, the same process that goes on in the blood vessels, in the brain, and around the heart can occur elsewhere. And uh, we have to fix that as well, okay? So it's important for you to, to have an idea, or not an idea, you need to know the arterial supply to, to the whole body. You know, you already know the blood supply to the heart, um, and uh, you should know the blood supply to the brain. But when we talk about peripheral artery disease, we talk about the, the and it's mainly arteries we're dealing with now, the arterial supply to all the other uh organs and tissues except the brain and the heart. So we, we, we're gonna look into those a little bit because some, we, we usually get, um, some of the blood vessels uh, tend to, to occlude or to, to, to be obstructed more than others. So, you know, those that um, tend to be obstructed a little bit more will pay more attention to them, of course. If, if you look at the, the the uh, arterial supply of the upper extremity, and they they don't occlude, they don't block commonly, okay? But, you know, when we're doing our cardiac catheterization and our coronary intervention, we use the, 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 the radial artery, we cannulate the radial artery. So it's, it's important to have an idea of the arterial supply of the upper extremity. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over it. So you have the radial artery, and the radial artery, we say, is on the lateral aspect of the um, upper limb. That is, you know, from the thumb, the same side as the thumb, you have the radial artery. And when we're doing uh, cardiac catheterization, coronary intervention, we usually cannulate this blood vessel. On the other side, the medial side, you have the ulnar artery. And these two blood vessels uh, coalesce, they, they meet up at about the antecubital fossa, okay? And then they form the brachial artery, and then the brachial artery uh, uh, becomes the axillary artery. And then the axillary artery, along with these artery, um, uh, forms the, the, the subclavian. So, you know, if it's on the right side, you have the right subclavian. The left side, you have the left subclavian. Importantly, though, coming off the the the, the subclavian, just at the, the we'll call the proximal portion of the subclavian, you have what we call this is the internal thoracic or the internal mammary artery. We use this blood vessel commonly when we're doing uh, bypass surgery. So. This blood vessel, we use it when we're doing bypass surgery. And then you have the, the vertebral artery also comes off the left, uh, sorry, the subclavian, the vertebral artery. So it's a rough anatomy of uh, the blood, the arterial supply, the upper extremity. And of course, uh, again, the importance of it is when, when we're doing um, uh, cardiac catheterization, uh, coronary intervention, because we commonly cannulate the, 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 the radial artery, okay? And then again, importantly, you, you have the, 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 the internal mammary or the internal thoracic comes off there and the vertebral artery, okay? So that, that's uh, the, 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 the upper extremity arteries. The, when you come to the aortic arch, you have to know the blood vessel that comes off the aortic arch. Um, 
if, of course, you have the aortic valve which resides inside the heart, and then you have the aortic root, the ascending aorta, and then the arch, aortic arch. The first blood vessel that you get from the aortic arch is what we call the brachiocephalic, and then your brachiocephalic give rise to your right subclavian, and then you have the right common carotid right there. The, 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 the common carotid is going to divide into an internal and an external carotid. This, uh, the next blood vessel is what we call the uh, arterial thyroid. It's, it, it, it's not a consistent blood vessel, so we, we, we're not going to include it. But you have the, the, the left common carotid. That's not the next blood vessel, left common carotid. And then the left common carotid is going to divide into an internal carotid and an external carotid. And then you get your left subclavian. So the arch vessels, you have to know your arch vessels, okay? Because uh, they can become uh, occluded, not commonly, but they can, can become occluded. Now, we commonly evaluate the carotid arteries and, and in particularly the, the internal carotid artery because that's the, the, the blood vessel which goes to the brain. So if that blood vessel is occluded or any problem with that blood vessel, you can, you can get a stroke. So remember the, the common carotid is going to divide into your, into your external and your internal carotid artery. And these blood vessels are commonly evaluated when we um, when we assessing for uh, uh, when we assessing the carotid artery. Common difference between your external and your internal carotid artery. Your internal carotid artery is the the blood vessel that goes to the brain in particularly. So there is no branch. There is no branch of this blood vessels other than when it gets to the brain, as opposed to your internal, sorry, as opposed to your external carotid artery, where, where you have a lot of branches going to the face, okay? So if, if you're asked to, to, to label these blood vessels as internal or external, the, the blood vessel that has the branches going to the face is your external. The internal carotid artery has no branch uh, until it gets to the brain, okay? Your common carotid. So knowing the anatomy is very important if you're gonna evaluate uh, these blood vessels. So again, if, you, if you're looking, you know, this is the left side, right side. On the right side, this is the aortic arch. Of course, this is your aortic arch. So you're gonna have your this is your brachiocephalic, and it gives right to your right subclavian, then the common carotid, and then you're going to have your uh, external and internal. The internal have no branch until it gets to the brain. And then on the left side, the anatomy is a little bit different. You have your left common carotid artery, and then it divides into your internal carotid, your external carotid. Remember, the internal carotid have no branches in the face until you get to the brain. The external is the one that have the branches. And then you have your left subclavian. Come, coming off your left subclavian, you have your left vertebral. The vertebral artery goes into the brain. And then just, you know, on the, on the, the opposite side, you're going to have your internal mammary or thoracic, internal thoracic. So you have to know the anatomy of uh, the branch vessels of the, uh, the aorta. Now we come to the lower extremity. And of course, you know, the aorta, you have a thoracic aorta, and you have an abdominal aorta. Uh, the diaphragm uh, divides the aorta into thoracic and abdominal. The abdominal aorta comes straight down and it divides, okay, the abdominal aorta divides in its lowermost, lowermost course to give you the common, if we're talking about the, the right side, or anyway, you, you have the common iliac. 
So the abdominal aorta is going to give rise to the iliac arteries. So you have your common iliac artery. Your common il iliac artery is going to divide into an external iliac and an internal iliac. The internal iliac is relatively small, uh, okay? And of course into the pelvis, whereas your external iliac will come is going to come down. You have a ligament right here. We call this the inguinal ligament. So this is an, a ligament we call the inguinal ligament. Once your once your uh, external iliac courses under the uh, the inguinal ligament, it becomes the femoral artery. Okay. You have the femoral artery, and then the femoral artery divides into a deep femoral artery, and then you have a superficial femoral artery. So the, the, it comes straight down, and just at the back of the leg, uh, uh, where you have the knee, just at the back of the knee, it divides, uh, you get what we call a popliteal, okay? So it, it becomes a popliteal artery. And in the leg itself, um, it, it divides into three branches, and we will we'll, we'll, we'll just look at that. So again, the abdominal aorta gives rise to the common iliac. The common iliac gives you your internal iliac, your external iliac. Just as it passes through the inguinal ligament, it becomes the common femoral artery. And that common femoral artery divides into a deep femoral, and then you have the superficial femoral artery. Superficial femoral artery is commonly occluded and needs some type of intervention. Uh, so just behind the knee, it gives rise to what we call the popliteal artery. And then you have further division. We have the anterior tibial, your posterior tibial, and your peroneal. Your anterior tibial, your anterior tibial um, is, 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 is more in the front, okay? And then your posterior tibial is more on the lateral side of the leg. The posterior tibial is more on the lateral side, and the peroneal is more on the, sorry, the, the posterior tibial is more in the medial, and the peroneal is more in the lateral, okay? So those are sort of the main blood vessels in the lower extremity. Again, right common carotid, uh, right external, just as you course under the inguinal ligament, you have the right femoral, you have the deep, and you have the superficial, then the peroneal, sorry, the, the popliteal, right, just be, 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 uh, at the knee, at the back side of the knee, okay? Then you're going to have your anterior tibial, which I would say run anterior in the front. The peroneal is more on the lateral aspect of the leg, and then the posterior tibial is more on the medial aspect. So those are some of the, 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 the blood vessels. Um, we 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 are gonna look at the, the 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 aorta and its branches in a little in a, in a little bit more detail um, at another time. We're gonna look at we'll look at the thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta. We we're gonna separate those out because um, uh, we we wanna you know stress the the disease state that is associated with. Um, that, that blood vessel. Now, when we talk about peripheral artery disease, what, what exactly we're we talking about? You know, you have blockage of the blood vessel uh, other than blood vessels around the heart and the brain, and then how the patient presents. What is the clinical presentation? How are you going to know that the patient has some type of blockage? Uh, so we usually talk about the five Ps, okay? Patients with peripheral artery disease, uh, if they're symptomatic, they'll have, you know, one or more of the five Ps. We talk about pain. Once you block the blood vessel, uh, the area that's not getting any blood supply is going to let you know because the patient's going to have pain. Pulselessness, because remember, the, 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 
the pulse is due to arterial flow in the arteries. So if there's no flow or reduced flow in the arteries, uh, you might get a decreased pulse or no pulse at all. So pulselessness, pallor. Remember the, the rich uh, blood supply is due to the artery feeding the, 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 the tissue and the organs. So if there is no blood supply, it's going to be pale, pallor. Parasthesia, because the nerves, once the nerves stop getting nutrients, they're going to let you know. You're going to have, you know, you'll have your pain, you'll have your numbness, your tingling, your burning, that type of thing we would call parasthesia. And then paralysis because of the, the, the nerves and the muscle not functioning properly because of decreased uh, blood supply. So the five Ps is an, is an important uh, presentation of uh, peripheral artery disease, pain, pulselessness, paraparesthesia, and paralysis. However, 50% of your patients with peripheral artery disease tend to be asymptomatic. They have no symptoms. So when they come to see the doctor, the doctor will have to ask questions, take a, take a detailed history from the patient, and then not only the history, but they have to examine the patient, and then you might see uh, uh, or you might elicit signs that there is a, a peripheral artery disease, blockage of the blood vessel. You know, you might have decreased pulse. You might have an ulcer. You might have a pallor. You might have coldness when you examine the extremity. It might be very cold. So the history and the examination is also very important, okay? So again, 50% uh, uh, of patients with peripheral artery disease are going to be asymptomatic. And then about 15% uh, about of your patients will have your typical claudication. And claudication is uh, for the low extremity. When the patient walk because there is not enough blood supply, they'll have pain. And the pain is usually in the, if it's, um, you know, if, it, if it's above the knee, they'll, they'll present with claudication, uh, uh, pain in the calves when they walk. You can also have claudication in the buttocks if the, if, the, if the blockage is higher up, you know, say the iliac or even above in the aorta. So they have, they have pain in the buttocks. So claudication is pain or discomfort when the um, patient uh, ambulates and then you may have atypical leg pain. You know, they may have burning or some, some other thing, you know. Uh, in, a, in a very small percentage of the patient, the, the clinical presentation is what we call critical limb ischemia, pulselessness, pain, severe pain, pallor. These are patients who need attention immediately. And, you know, you, the, the, the vascular surgeon or whoever does the, the, the evaluation of these patients after coming and see the patient uh, immediately, lest they'll lose their, the, the limb or extremity. So the, the, the risk factors, what are conditions that predispose one for peripheral artery disease? Um, of course, the same thing that predispose them to to, to a heart attacks, smoking, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, and a family history. Family history suggests it's a genetic uh, process. But these are the, the common risk factors that uh, predispose one to peripheral artery disease and coronary artery disease as well. And when we say risk factors, it will give rise to what we call the atherosclerotic plaque in a small percentage of patients, you'll have vascular spasm. The blood vessel will go into spasm and clamp down, and the patient will have, you know, symptoms related to the blood vessel uh, closing off. You know, your pain, your pallor, pulselessness, uh, all of that type of thing. But the, the majority, 99% of your patients are going to present with atherosclerotic plaque. And what, 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 what is atherosclerotic plaque? So your normal artery, if you were to cut it and look at it in cross-section, 
you know, looks like this smooth lumen. We, t we usually talk about the, the three walls. You have your intima, your media, and your adventitia, okay? The intima is uh, just below your endothelium, and then your media is the muscle layer, and then the adventitia is the outer layer. When you develop atherosclerotic plaque, the lumen or the opening in the blood vessel is compromised. It is, it is reduced, okay? So the, this buildup right here is what we call the atherosclerotic plaque, okay? So this buildup is the atherosclerotic plaque, and you can see, you know, so what is, what is the atherosclerotic plaque? So we think uh, your atherosclerotic plaque forms when your bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, becomes oxidized. If the LDL cholesterol becomes oxidized, it is readily taken up into the arterial wall. And this is now engulfed by macrophage. These are some uh, cells inside the, uh, the, 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 the media, uh, uh, the, the middle layer of the muscle wall, the media. So these macrophages eats up the oxidized LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and they form these foam cells. And the foam cells gradually increase in size to give you these plaques. Okay, so these are outpouching or build up in the arterial wall. So the LDL, the bad cholesterol, becomes oxidized, taken up into the wall of the, the artery. And macrophages are attracted to these uh, oxidized LDL and they eat them up and form foam cells. Foam cells give rise to the plaque. So over time, of course, your normal artery with a small amount of plaque and then severe. Over time, these plaque get larger and larger and larger. And they, they will obstruct the blood flow. They will obstruct the, the flow of blood through these um, uh, arteries. And then the patient will have the symptoms related to reduce blood flow. Again, your normal LT artery, consider the red blood cell uh, flowing through, through the artery. Then you have a small plaque process as we described before. Then as the plaque gets larger, it obstructs blood flow. Then the patients will complain of claudication and stuff like that. But you can have an acute abrupt uh, process where the plaque ruptures. If the plaque ruptures, it leaks out this gooey material which causes blood to clot readily on top of the, 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 the plaque. So you're getting what we call an acute occlusion, an, or an abrupt occlusion. So when the plaque ruptures, blood clots on it, and you get complete occlusion of the, the blood vessel. And that is when the patient will uh, present with uh, critical limb ischemia, no pulse, very cold, extreme pain, okay? So, so some type of intervention needs to be done. And if you were to look at it under the microscope, it looks like this. You can see there's actually a blood clot on top of the plaque, uh, giving rise to complete occlusion of the um, blood vessel. So how do we classify these uh, uh, patients? When they come to you, we, you know, or they come to see the doctor, you have to put them in a, in a class or a grade. We talk about a grade. So, we have the Rutherford classification, and that goes from grade zero to grade three. Grade zero, the patient is asymptomatic. They have blockage, but they're asymptomatic. Grade one, they have myclaudication when they walk for some distance. They have pain in the calves or pain in the buttocks, okay? And we also divide it into categories. So you might have grade one, category one, mild claudication, grade one, category two, moderate claudication, they walk at a short, small, shorter distance and they have uh, pain. Or you may, you may have grade one, category three, severe claudication, um, 
with um, probably a short distance. And then you have your grade two patients where they have rest, ischemic rest pain. So they have pain, say, in the lower extremity at rest. And you, your grade two, you have category three, four, and five. Um, so your category four is just the, the, the ischemia at rest. Category five, minor tissue loss. I may have ulcerations, stuff like that. And then your Rutherford grade three, they have major tissue loss, severe ulcers because of uh, decreased arterial uh, flow. But, you know, if you just know the, the, the grade, you know, you have grade zero to three. Three is bad, zero is good, okay? So as the grade gets higher, it suggests a, a more severe disease. Okay, we also have the Fontaine classification and pretty much the same, the Fontaine is a stage and it goes from stage one to stage uh, four. You have stage one, asymptomatic as usual, uh, stage 2A, mild claudication, stage 2B, moderate to severe claudication, stage three, rest pain, and uh, stage four, they have an ulcer or gangrene because of no blood supply. Remember that tissues always need arterial blood flow. And if the, the artery cannot supply nutrients, the tissue is going to die. And that's how you get ulcers and gangrene, the tissue dies. So the greater the stage, the, the more severe the disease process. So you have your Rutherford classification and your Fontaine classification. Uh, those are two that are used in clinical practice. So what are some of the tests? So, you know, that's where we come in. How, 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 how are we going to evaluate these patients? Or what are the tests that we can use to evaluate these patients to, defer, to determine severity? So the non-invasive tests that we're going to use is the ABI, Ankle Brachial Index. Okay, it's a very simple test and should be done on all your patients. Your ABI, your pulse volume recording, and your segmental pressures. So these are some of the, the, the basic tests that uh, we do. And then after you do these tests, then you go on to your duplex ultrasound to evaluate the artery. And you may go on to do a MR, MRI, MRA. Uh, magnet, magnetic resonance imaging or your magnetic resonance angi angiogram. Or you might do a, a, a CT scan, a CAT scan, or you might do a CT angiogram, okay? Uh, and then if you're going to do any intervention, then you do your peripheral angiogram, okay? Um, okay, so when we talk about ABI, pulse volume recording and segmental pressures. What exactly are we talking about? So when you do your ankle brachial index, what you do, you do your blood pressure in, in the brachial, you do your brachial blood pressure and you do your pressure in the lower extremity. The, the pressures in the lower extremity should be greater than the pressure in the upper extremity. And we only use the systolic pressure. So you do the you do your blood pressure in both arms, okay, both arms, and then you do the pressure in in both legs, okay. So we're gonna use the systolic pressure uh, in 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 the upper and the lower extremity. Again, the systolic pressure in the lower extremity is usually equal to or greater than uh, the pressures in the upper extremity. So you expect the pressures in the lower extremity to be greater or equal to the pressure in the upper extremity. If you get a decrease in the ankle pressures compared to the brachial pressures, that signifies the, present, the presence of flow-limiting uh, proximal arterial disease. It suggests that you have disease in your lower extremity. Okay, If the pressures in the ankle is lower than the pressure in the, in the upper extremity, it is telling you that the patient is have a problem with blood flowing into the lower extremity. That's what the ankle brachial index means. Okay, you're gonna do your pressures in the upper extremity, the pressure in the lower extremity, 
okay? You use the systolic pressure, systolic pressure in the ankle divided by the systolic pressure in the, um, in the brachials, okay? So a brachial pressure gradient greater than 20. So that means if your pressure in the upper extremity is greater than the pressure in the ankles by more than 20 millimeters mercury, it suggests significant narrowing, okay, um, of the, the subclavian uh, or the axillary artery uh, on the side of the, 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 the lower pressure. Okay. Uh, the higher the two arms pressure will be. So you, when you do the, the, the two arms, you should um, use the, the, the higher pressure. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm not sure if you guys follow this, but the, what this is saying, you're going to do the pressure in the both arms, right? In the left and the right. If one of the pressures in the upper extremity is greater than the other by more than 20, it suggests that you have a narrowing of the subclavian or axillary artery on the side with a lower pressure. Okay, so the pressures, the difference in the pressure of the two arms should be less than 10 uh, millimeters mercury systolic pressure. If the difference in pressure is more than 20, it su suggests that there is, a, there is a blockage of the blood vessel in the arm with the lower pressure. Okay, and when you're doing the ABI, you use the higher of uh, the two arm pressures. So again, it is a systolic blood pressure in the arm divided by the systolic blood pressure in the, the ankle. So, and you're gonna get a, a, a ratio. So, so it, it, it's a ratio. If, when you do your ankle brachial index, if it's one to say 1.4, then it's, it's relatively normal, no significant peripheral artery disease. If, however, your systolic brachial to your systolic ankle is between 0.9 and 1, it suggests borderline disease. Because remember, the ankle pressure is supposed to be greater than the uh, brachial pressure. That's the pressure in the arms. If the ratio is less than 0.9, it suggests abnormal ankle brachial index. It's abnormal. If it's less than 0.4, then that's very severe. And you may have critical limb ischemia. Okay, so it's saying the same thing. But if, if when you do your ratio, if you get, if it's more than 1.3, we talk about, we, we say it's poorly compressible. The, the, the ankle, the, the arteries in, in, in the legs is poorly compressible. And again, it is the ankle systolic uh, uh, blood pressure to the, the, the harm systolic blood pressure. Okay, so it's the, 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 the pressure in the ankle divided by the pressure in the arms. The pressure in the, the, the legs or the ankle is supposed to be greater than pressure in the arms. So it's called the ankle brachial index. So the ankle systolic pressure divided by the, the blood pressure in the, the arms. Okay? So 0.9 to 1.3 is normal. And up to 0.9, uh, roughly about 0.9 to 1 to, to our 0.9 to 1, um, is mildly abnormal, uh, moderate is 0 0.4 to 0 0.69, and then severe if it's less than 0 0.4, okay? So this is a simple test that once you suspect that the patient have a peripheral artery disease, this is a simple test that uh, should be done, your ankle brachial index. You take the blood pressure in the arm, the blood pressure in the legs, the blood pressure, the, the, the ratio, the ABI is the ratio of the leg pressures, the systolic pressure. Systolic pressures in the legs divided by the systolic pressure in the arms, ankle brachial index. Okay, 0.9 to 1.3 is normal. 0.7 to 0.9 suggests mild disease. 0.4 to 0.69 suggests moderate disease, and less than 0.4 uh, su suggests severe disease, okay? 
So the ankle brachial index, relatively simple. Now the pulse volume recording, um, and when we do these, these, these tests, we have, a, it looks like a series of blood pressure cuffs on the, the lower extremity at different levels. And in addition to doing your, because at each level, you're going to do the pressure. All the pressures in the lower extremity should be greater than the pressures in the upper extremity. Okay? So at each level, you're going to do, even though, you know, we call it ABI, but it's different levels in the lower extremity. It's not really the ankle, but, you know, we go all the way down to the ankle. You're going to do the pressures. And it, it also gives you what we call a pulse volume recording. It looks like a Doppler signal. And it's, a, you know, if you can call it a Doppler signal. So your normal uh, signal should look somewhat like this. You have a systolic pressure, you have a diastolic pressure, and you have a dichrotic notch. Okay? So this is what a normal signal looks like. This is what your normal signal looks like, okay? You have your, your systolic and you have your diastolic, your dichrotic notch, okay? Once you start getting disease, then you'll lose your dichrotic notch, okay? The, the amplitude is going to be less reduced. And then with severe disease, the amplitude is significantly reduced. You can also have uh, something looking like this, okay? Reduced amplitude, loss of the dichrotic notch, okay? You can also have uh, reduced amplitude, uh, prolongation of uh, the pulse, and then you can have what look like a, a flat line, uh, severe. So this is normal. So you have to know the, what the normal, uh, the normal uh, uh, pulse volume recording looks like. And then, you know, you can just, you can look and see when, when, when it is abnormal. The amplitude, the loss of the diacrotic notch, um, if, if, if uh, your wave sort of spreads out like that, okay? All right, so this is what, uh, this is what I, I meant by, so you're going to have cuffs all at all different levels. So you're going to have your cuffs at all different levels. But when you do your ankle brachial index, you'll have your lower cuff and you have your cuff on the, the arm. So all you do before you start this test, you, you know, you do the blood pressure in the upper extremities and you get your systolic pressure. You do your blood pressure in the lower extremity. And then you do your, you put your systolic ankle pressure over your systolic uh, brachial pressure and you get your ABI. You're also going to do it for each level. You're going to do that same thing for each level. So you do it at the ankle, mid leg, upper leg, lower thigh, and upper thigh. Okay? So you're going to do the pressures at all these levels. Not only are you going to do the pressures, but you're going to get your pulse volume recording. And the, the instrument is going to give you pulse volume recording for your upper thigh pulse volume recording for the lower thigh, pulse volume recording for the calves and the ankle. And again, it's supposed to have a nice systolic uh, configuration, your dichrotic notch, your diastolic. So you see all of these waves have these nice. But if you look over here on this side, you don't, you don't have your, the, the, the amplitude is somewhat reduced. You don't have your dichrotic notch. And then as you go down, uh, you can see that the amplitude is reduced. So this patient is having problems from, from right up here because the upper thigh recording shows that there's reduction in the amplitude, loss of the diacrotic notch. So you, you, from, from these recordings, you're gonna, you're gonna suspect that there's an obstruction above this level. So the obstruction could be at the femoral artery, it could be at the, the, the common, um, common iliac, 
or even uh, well, it's on it's only on the, the 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 left side. So it has to be if it was in the aorta, the distal aorta, it affect both the right and the left. But because it's only on the left side, it's probably could be from the common iliac, the external iliac, or the femoral. Okay. So this is what we call the pulse volume recording. And not only that, but you're going to get the ankle brachial index for each level. So you, you can determine how severe uh, the disease process is. So or, or we're going to stop here. But the next lecture, we'll look at a few abnormal uh, pulse volume recordings and ankle brachial index. And then we'll go on to the other studies um, we, we will look at uh, your your duplex scan, okay? And then we'll look at duplex scan, look in the duplex scan at the carotid arteries, the aorta, and uh, the lower extremity um, arterial system. And um, then we'll look at some MRAs. Uh, we'll look at some CTAs. And... Um, uh, angiograms with intervention. Okay, so we're going to stop here.